I invite you to hear this word that comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Listen to these words that Jesus shares with us. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear who, him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thank be to God. Keeping these words in mind, a question, what is confirmation? Any takers? What is confirmation? You got a thought? To say yes, confirm. What else? What do you think it is? What is confirmation? Something that makes you stronger. This is the choir. How about you guys? (laughs) What is confirmation? Exactly. What is confirmation? Popcorn, come on. To proclaim your baptism? To claim your baptism? Thank you. To confirm promises that were made when you were baptized. Any other thoughts of what this might be? Say it again. Making a commitment. Okay. Keep thinking with this. A lot of you might not know that I was raised Baptist... And uh, you know, how, how many people we have in this place that were raised the Baptists? Wow, look at that. So, Becky, we might not be doing good per capita with the UCCers, but we've roped in the Baptists here. <laughs> we're working on it. So, these Baptist folk uh, don't have confirmation in the church. Uh, in the Baptist church, we practice what's called believer's baptism, where when you are a forward-thinking child or teenager or an adult, you make that decision for yourself that I am ready to be baptized and make that outward profession of faith through the waters of baptism to be a disciple of Christ. And so not knowing about confirmation per se, when teaching a confirmation class here uh, for the first time in 2007, I went, wow, I really want to do right by the kids. And so I just started up uh, a doctorate at the seminary And so I talked to the dean and said, look, I want to do an independent study about confirmation because I need to learn as much as I possibly can about this. And I immersed myself in all things confirmation for a good semester and ended up producing a reformed theology of confirmation. It was a big learning experience. But you get the gist. When I hear that question from my background, what is confirmation? I'm genuinely Curious, And so lucky for me, I had the opportunity to 
direct confirmation camp for the entire conference, our, our own UCC conference, and leave it to the United Church of Christ, the denomination that says God is still speaking, to put a Baptist reared minister in charge of teaching young people about confirmation. And so, on the first morning of camp, I asked that question that I just shared with you, what is confirmation? And the responses started coming from all over the place about what that meant to everybody. And as those responses were going on, I noticed that there was this one boy who was sitting in the corner kind of off to himself, and his body language was saying, I don't want to be here. And when the responses started to die down, I asked one more time, okay, so any other responses, what is confirmation? And the boy in the back of the room said, a waste of time. And I went, okay, uh, we'll make note of that. Young people have the gift of an unrefined honesty. <laughs> and that unrefined honesty can expose things for what they are, you know? And so I held on to the boy's comment. Fair enough. If it's true that confirmation can be a waste of time, then how so? I mean, I appreciate how adults teaching young people in different contexts can be boring, but a waste of time? This age-old right in the Christian church? How so? In today's scripture from Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has given his disciples the authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal people. He's given them the charge to share the bold goodness of the gospel, and now he's giving them instructions for how to go about that good work. It's a rite of passage moment, and in terms of confirmation, it's a confirming moment. The disciples have been with Jesus long enough at this point to know what he's all about, what he stands for, and what he will not stand, and what it will take to follow him from this point forward. And now, hearing these instructions from their master, the disciples are given the opportunity to confirm this Jesus, to say yes to what the UCC's statement of faith calls the cost and joy of discipleship, or to denounce him to call it a day and, and head home. So I wonder if Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and James, and John, and the rest of them had heard Jesus' instructions, and they declined his invitation to go out and share the good news of the gospel. Wouldn't everything that they'd been through at that point, wouldn't it all have just been a waste? Wouldn't everything that they'd learned from Jesus about the love of God for all people, regardless of who they are or where they come from, and about how the spirit of the law always supersedes the letter of the law, and about the dignity and well-being of God's people always being above any religious doctrines or taboos. Wouldn't all of that just become a waste of time? And I'm wondering the same thing about the church. In a recent blog in the Huffington Post's religion section, Steve McSwain writes that, According to the Hartford Institute of Religion Research, more than 40% of Americans say they go to church weekly. As it turns out, however, less than 20% are actually in church. In other words, more than 80% of Americans are finding more fulfilling things to do on the weekends. Furthermore, he writes, somewhere between 4,000 and 7,000 churches close their doors every year. With more and more people leaving the church or seeing no relevance in going to church whatsoever, and with so many mainline Protestant congregations declining in number and closing their doors, I wonder, has church become a waste of time? How so? We Christians, the ones who claim to follow Jesus when we go to church, when we're in this place, we hear those words from Jesus that we heard just a moment ago, those same instructions about a life of discipleship. It's in church that we sing Jesus' assuring words about God's eye being on the sparrow. It's in church that we learn about how following Jesus might have the consequence of suffering, even to the point of death but that we're always in God's hands. It's in church that we hear Jesus' invitation to pick up our cross and follow him into every corner of this world's brokenness. It's in church that we pray for the salvation of our lives for, by losing them for, for Christ's sake. 
when we pray those words together every Sunday, it's what we mean when we're saying, Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Not mine. It's in church that we sing with our children. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. It's in here that we do that. And it's when worship ends that we leave the sanctuary and go out into the world and that we're presented with confirming moments. It's out there, out in the world, that we're faced with moments for us to confirm or to deny the Jesus that we experience in the church building. But when that confirming moment involves risk, how quickly we're tempted to dismiss what we experience in church. A ministry in our community gets started. This is how it began for us and other sanctuaries, other congregations in this community. Family promise. This ministry invites our church to open its doors to families who are homeless, to provide them with food and lodging for a few nights. And, and we hear Jesus whisper that when he was a stranger, we invited him in by offering such hospitality to the least of these. But we worry about liability issues. What if a child gets hurt running around in our sanctuary? What if these strangers in our church building mess up the rooms that are set aside for classes on Sunday morning? We don't want to suffer that risk. In our household, a family member talks at the dinner table about Christianity being under attack. Everyone around the table listens intently to this person's scathing commentary about atheists and people of other faiths being condemned by God and how we Christians should stay away from those people if we care at all about saving our religion. And then we hear the whisper of Jesus saying that he was not sent into the world to condemn and that following him calls us to love one another so that the world will realize by that love that we are his disciples. Yeah, but if we speak up, if we voice that whisper out loud at the dinner table, it might draw an irreconcilable line between us and our beloved family member. It might turn us against each other, and our household cannot accept that risk. In our church, a long-time member graduates from the local seminary. This is something that I experienced in a church that I served prior to coming here to Friends Church. Long-time member graduates from the local seminary. And the fact that she identifies as a lesbian was never a source of concern, but now she wants to take that next step in her calling and be ordained for ministry by the church. Then comes the whisper of Jesus reminding us that we don't choose him any more than we can choose the ones who serve him. That Jesus chooses us and appoints us to go and share the good news of the gospel. This is the whisper that we hear. Yeah, but if we, or, if we ordain an openly gay woman, we might lose church members, and we might lose their financial support, and we might be cut off from certain organizations that give us funding. The church, as we know it, might die. And our congregation can't afford that risk. William Sloan Coffin has a benediction that I often borrow in this place. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord's face shine upon you and grant you grace. Grace to risk something big for something good. If there's any truth to the notion that the mainline Protestant church is in decline, I believe it's only to the extent that the church is in decline outside the church building. When the things that we hear whispered in the sanctuary are not proclaimed from the rooftops by our actions in the world, when what we learn about Jesus in the church is not embodied by our deeds in the world, then even the largest endowment fund won't halt the church's decline. Because the church is not our buildings that we protect from the risks of suffering and divisions and even death. The church is the embodiment of the gospel. The church is the people. The church is you, the people who embody Jesus Christ. The church is the people who embody the love of God. Anything less is a waste of time. 
and it was time to take our group picture at confirmation camp, I happened to be sitting next to that boy who was in the back of the room, and his body language showed that he'd kind of warmed up to the whole confirmation thing throughout the weekend. But he, re- he retained his, his unrefined honesty. And actually, when this sermon was on day one, I got a call from one of my fellow ministers, I won't say which church, and she said, was that this boy? And I said, yeah, that was, that was him. That was him. She said, oh, he got confirmed. So there you go. The photographer was telling us, okay, it's time to take the group shot. Everybody smile. And so the boy sitting next to me said, look at me, look at me. I'm smiling like the preacher on TV. Look at my white teeth. Give me your money. Is there any truth in that? I think the boy in the back of the room was something of a prophet. Here he was denouncing the church's comfort with fluff crying out to anyone with ears to hear about what he sees as hypocrisy. The boy may have just been making sport of the flashy televangelist, but what I heard, I heard a young person's exposure of the church. The exposure of the church that hears the distinct whisper about justice and mercy and forgiveness and healing and inclusiveness and love in this place, and then keeps those powerful truths stored away in a sanctuary. I heard the voices of so many people in the world begging for the church to do something more and to be more authentic to Christ's instructions. Take up your cross and follow me. Lose your life for my sake and you will find it. Not long ago, I attended a meeting that was open to the public at Texas A&M. And there was a student there named Levi who was presenting on his experience with reparative therapy and his research of so-called ex-gay ministries. We had the blessing of Levi being with us in this place just right over here, sharing that same presentation with us on a Wednesday night a few weeks ago. And to a room of roughly 50 people, Levi talked about being raised in a Christian home, about being very active in his church's youth group, and devoting his life to following Jesus. Levi said that when he came out to his parents, they made him attend camps where the young people were told that they needed to stop being gay or they were going to go to hell. And in one of the camps, two people Levi knew committed suicide. Levi initially tried to be straight, an experience that I know some people in this room share. But the more he noticed his fellow campers and counselors alike struggle to maintain a facade, the less he could believe that Jesus would condemn him because of who God made him to be. When reparative therapy failed to change Levi, he suddenly had enemies in his household. When Levi came out to his mom... Initially, what happened is he said those words to his mom, I'm gay, and her response, as she had been trained by her Christian pastor, was simply, no. His parents kicked him out. Somehow, Levi was able to finish high school and then get into A&M. Levi's brother also attends A&M, but when they cross paths on campus, Levi's brother still won't acknowledge him. And during the Q&A at the presentation on campus, someone asked Levi, after all that, do you still identify as a Christian? And I have to say, as a side note, acknowledging that I'm a pastor in that setting, I had a timidity about asking that very question. I felt like that wasn't my place. So thankfully, somebody else did. After all that, do you still identify as a Christian? And Levi said, you know, when I came out to the people at my church, Losing that community was tough. Losing those friends in my life was tough. But yes, I am a Christian. And I heard his answer as a powerful confirmation of Jesus. Here was a testimony of a young man who knew suffering, who knew about family turning against him, who knew about life as he knew it, dying, Yet in the face of it all, he did not forget the instructions of the one he continues to follow, 
Fear not. Don't be afraid. That phrase that is uttered 366 times in the Bible, enough for every day of the year and then some. Don't be afraid. Here was a disciple of Christ, and although we weren't in a church building, Levi had taken us to church. Why do we turn against the ones like Levi in our midst? Is it because of some infallible interpretation of Scripture? That's a symptom, sure, but it goes deeper than that. Homophobia is what informs our reading of Scripture, not the other way around. If we turn to the Bible with fear, then all we will find are ways to defend our privilege, ways to maintain our self-preservation, ways to survive. But if we turn to Jesus' instructions with fear, it's the same thing. All we're going to find are comforts whispered in the dark and then forgotten. But Jesus invites us to take up our cross and follow him because in taking on the cost and the joy of discipleship, we lose our fearful lives in Christ and save them in the process. If we who claim to follow Jesus would confirm this truth outside the sanctuary, then the world might start seeing those churches that we attend as not so much of a waste of time after all. They might start seeing us living and not just surviving, and see that that's not such a waste of time after all. Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, thank you for opening our hearts and minds to your word. May they remain open to the confirming moments you place before us every day in this world that you call good. May the sword of your son, Jesus Christ, cut away the fears that grip us until we are set free to say yes to you and to set free and to be set free to confirm your daily invitation to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to be fearless in loving our neighbors as ourselves. Amen.